Yeah, it's going to be a fun one today, I think, for me at least. I'm, I'm looking at it as a fun one. Um, it's going to be interesting. See how it goes. Before we get started, I had a quick question. At the, at the very end, he said like a thousand something. Was that like a nod to the eventual a thousand plateaus? Or is that just a weird coincidence? Thousand something. Where? Yeah, in the in the very last paragraph. Uh, a thousand voices making all these voices speak. Uh, well, I mean, it that's a hell of a coincidence that he's describing about the multiple layers of things that are a thousand layers deep as Nietzsche dives into the surfaces, which you might. For example, I don't know, call, I don't know, plateaus. Yeah, with, I think that's with weird. Nietzsche also kind of fallen apart and he's not really a unity anymore. It made me think of the Wolfman. It's like it's a pack rather than a, a unity and that sort of thing. Hmm. Ooh. Ooh. Maybe. Maybe. Hmm. Great. Now you got me thinking about that. I won't be. Able... Sorry. Sorry. It's fine. It's fine. Well, we'll uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we'll kick off. We'll see what we've got going here. Uh, we'll give everyone a few minutes uh, to join because, again, uh, started a little bit late, which happens. Uh, it's been a long weekend for me. I uh, I've been searching for the last three weeks for a new place to live because my landlord is selling. So finally found a place yesterday. So uh, been a lot of paperwork and stuff this morning, getting everything in order. Jesus. So, so apologies for starting. I'm moving like 10 minutes away. I'm not moving again. Like my, my big move from LA to Portland, not doing one of those again anytime soon, but uh, had to move. Landlord's selling. That's the way it goes. It's always unfortunate, especially if you're renting a long time, you kind of expect a, uh... A renewal of the lease every year or whatever it is and then all of a sudden rug from under you yeah yeah I, I, and i get the hell out <laughs> for sure so yeah it happens uh but we'll we're, we're landing somewhere good i'm actually going to have a little space that i can uh, section off with some soundproofing so uh, i'm excited to do a little bit more recording there and have a little bit more of an area uh, to do some stuff which is good uh so we'll give yeah, everyone a moment good. Yeah, we'll give everyone a moment to join. Um, this may be it also. Uh, sadly, we will not have Terrence here today. I think uh, Kent won't be joining. Uh, a handful of others, I think, are going to be skipping, which is a shame. This has been a really good, fun, larger group, but uh, the ebbs and flows of reading groups, I suppose, is the way it goes. Uh, I think this is going to be fun, though. So let me let me kick off. We'll just start a discussion. As people join, we'll just pick it up. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming to join us on this lovely Monday as we continue our reading of Logic of Sense on the Deleuze and Guattari Quarantine Collective Discord server. And uh, we're excited to have you here. If you like what we're doing, follow us on Twitter, D and G Q C. If uh, you want to support what we're doing, head over to Patreon and search for DGQC. Uh, today we're going to be continuing our reading of so very, very much um, inside of all of this. The, uh, the big one. Uh, for today, I think is going to be moving into series 15 as we start finally discussing singularities. Uh, I think anyone who was here with us uh, last week, or at least during our reading last week, I mean, I was talking about it last night with Cold Circle. Um, like last week, we just wanted to dive into singularities so quickly. And so finally, we're there. This very much feels like a continuing culmination of a lot of the things we've been building on top of each other. And I have a whole bunch of different thoughts and questions and all kinds of things. So uh, I'm excited to do it. Any Before we get going, any major announcements or comments or thoughts before we dive into the reading of uh, Singularity? Yeah, just one quick one for me. The Lit Group is trying something different in terms of scheduling because scheduling is a difficult one to work out on a server. So we're trying something a little bit more ad hoc to see how that goes. So there's a poll over in Lit Roundtable. Uh, feel free to uh, peruse and fill that, fill that out, and we'll announce a day when we got one.
Well, that's an exciting group of announcements. Um, we've got a whole bunch of other stuff happening on server. As always, hit up our uh, calendar. Uh, we've got, I think, uh, 16 readings going, uh, including our new Fanon reading, which is uh, exciting, as well as Bataille on Sunday, again, this next Sunday, if I get a chance to do it. As of course, anti Oedipus always on Tuesdays. Uh, this is going to be a fun one because I don't exactly know where to start, but series 15 is the series of singularities. As we had the discussion sort of in the last section when we talked about double causality, uh, the quasi cause of elements, uh, Deleuze has been building up uh, a an essence of how we should be describing how sense operates, how sense is produced, what sense does, and how these things work. The series of double causality, which we just kind of got through, the idea of the quasi-cause, was intended to sort of play through and talk through a bit of contradictory sides of how people have viewed sense before. Uh, it's a bit of an overall critique, is how I kind of read that and how we discussed it last week, with a, some really interesting insights that uh, I think think I started to grasp towards the end of it, I suppose I would say. Um, and one of the big sort of sets of this entire thing is that uh, he ends the last uh, discussion of uh, singularities, the anti-generality, which are however impersonal and pre-individual, must now serve as our hypothesis for the determination of this domain and its genetic power. The surface organization of this field, the transcendental field, how does this operate? This, this element that he's talking about that is pre-personal, impersonal, pre-individual. And finally, we get to get into the idea of singularities and how they operate. Uh, that's, that's my kickoff. Is that a fair kickoff for everyone to this one? Sounds good. All right. Best kickoff I've ever heard in my life. Ah, just so glad. Um, the, the, the way he then goes on inside of singularities, the, he opens up uh, with the idea of there are two moments of sense, the two moments of sense, impassibility and genesis, neutrality and productivity, uh, are not that one may, you know, slip for the other, that there's this two aspects of sense. On the one hand, we have the, the idea of, as uh, I'm going to steal what Cold Circle called it yesterday, we kind of have two versions of event. We have the capital E event, and then we have the event, little tiny E. Uh, the, on the one hand, we have the sense that is essentially a good in common sense, uh, the way things are expected to be, the way things are assumed to be, the ideas of God, the ideas of community. And then there's the, the sort of pre-personal or direct genetic, uh, gen genesises, genesising, it's not a word, terrible word, um, the, the productive aspect of sense that can create. And the opening here is kind of breaking down that capital E event and how it operates. Does anyone want to dive in before I give uh, the notes that Cold Circle and we kind of came up with yesterday? I'm happy to do that. But Yeah, I think it's, yeah, so I, just following up what you're saying, Brooks. So, so he's, as you say, the, the, he has this idea that an event is capitalized. Uh, and it, I think that's in opposition to the event as a physical, because there are two types of events. Is the the event um, um, as as we are kind of uh, um, as we're dealing with it, but it's the event as a physical thing. Uh, so the battle is has got is the um, is the um, sorry is the is the event which is like which is the um, sorry I'm. And get my head, my head around this one. The event is the, is the thing that hovers over the field. It's the uh, abstract, the, sorry, the neutral, the impassable thing. And um, the, the and he, what he does, he, he kind of uh, differentiates it through in terms of actualization, how he's experienced on the ground, he's experienced on the ground, so to speak, by the, by the participants. Um, as as in a, in the, at the level of actuality, they they actually take part in it. That's how they experience it as a as a kind of bodies coming together. But the the uh, event um, in this kind of universal sense is is the thing that hovers over it. So it's not very clear. That sorry. No, no, I I think that's very clear. Uh, so 
the way the way we were talking about it last night follows in line with that, I think, pretty cleanly. Um, the uh, you're unmuted, Derek. Um, the uh, the the way the way a battle may work for a soldier is you have, a, and as someone from suffers from PTSD, it's pretty accurate. But there's the thing when you go through it. Uh, Red Badge of Courage is the example Deleuze gives here, which is one of the times when I can say I read a book when I was young uh, that Deleuze mentions uh, that battles have two aspects. One is I've got my gun in my hand, the moment to moment thing that is happening as I'm going through it. And that's that's a battle. It's a, it's a fight. It's a stabbing. It's a shooting. It's a, a you know, thing I'm going through. Uh, we'll talk about it maybe in terms of Kronos versus Aeon. It's the thing I am actually experiencing that I'm able to sort of dissect. After a thing's happened, however, there is the battle. And when someone looks back and has that conversation, they were like, yeah, I was in the war. For example, as uh, someone who was in Vietnam or World War II, my grandfather would say the war. Uh, he wasn't talking about the battles he went through or the specific moments or any of that. He was talking about the overarching element. Uh, this large abstract is, I think abstract's fair, the representation of the event that is impassable, that is indivisible, that is a bit on the eternal side. And this, this element and this thing is itself not empirical. Really, it's very specifically, he's talking through it and he says that pretty cleanly a handful of times that we're not talking about uh, the, in, the empirical intuitions which correspond to types of actualization. Uh, we're talking about the intuition of uh, uh, the, the will that the event creates within a person, the, the way a person emotionally feels it, the, the, the representation of the larger thing that, that takes into a person. I, I mentioned with uh, Cold Circle last night, I, I, I mentioned I was a student at Columbine, but I talk about it a couple of different ways. On the one hand, I talk about it as, you know, I've, I've gone through and I've dissected the literal events of that day and talked through people that. Other times I make uh, comments where I'm like, that, you know, oh yeah, Columbine, like the whole thing, I'm referring to the name of the school or the event as this gigantic event that is over encompassing. These are the, the distinction he's making pretty strongly here in my mind. Does that work for anyone? Hello? Was it Stem Hall, Hugo, and Tolstoy? The stiff and cranes, the red badge, the red badge of courage, um, in which the hero des designates himself anonymous anonymously as quote the young man or quote the young soldier, and then he goes on to compare it with Carol and the way that there's something hovering over what the um, what's taking place. So I kind of see where. You, uh, especially where Derek's going with like the physical events and your point there too. And to, to add to that, one of the interesting things here is it looks like, it looks like he's got something um, indifferent and anonymous that is part of the distribution that's taking place. Well, it's, it's the handful of things he kind of, as he outlines it is we've got essentially the capital E event is something that is uh, fully actualized in various ways at once. There's a, a slamming together of a whole bunch of different shit happening at the same time. Uh, it's grasped, however, by every person who's experiencing it differently. There's a perspectivist approach to it. Uh, it hovers over all of uh, over all 
things, sort of in quantity, the particular, the general, or the quality, modality, which it goes on, which is the uh, apodeictic, interrogative, and some other thing uh, I have in my notes that I can't read, my handwriting sucks, uh, the relation and the type. Uh, it's also fully impassive. Uh, it can only be grasped by a will to indifference, which is an interesting phrasing he uses. Uh, but it, it, it creates and, and sort of empowers this sort of transcendental intuition of that will. So that's, there's a, a power and energy that it creates inside of the participants that he uses a, a handful of times here, and he describes it uh, specifically, uh, the phrase in the first paragraph, uh, the, <clears throat> oh, uh, the soldier needs a long struggle in order to arrive at this beyond of courage and cowardice this pure grasping of the event by means of a volitional intuition that is by means of the will that the event creates in him it's a really interesting sort of description of the process uh, and then the last bit is that this capital e event uh, always occurs within aeon it's not a chronos there's not not a chronos thing uh, to say the least Am I far off there? No, it sounds great. I, I'm just thinking to yeah. myself. You're you're talking about like two aspects. One is the moment to moment for the soldier, like like I you're kind of imagining different frames per second, and you're kind of going through the motions. And the other one would be the legacy, the memories of, your memories of the tragedy. And there's some, you know, life lessons, some chunked memories, details get forgotten. And I'm thinking to myself, people can think of themselves, like in the Red Badge of Courage, uh, as just a soldier in that particular battle. I was a small singularity. I was a small E in the big E event battle. And I guess it really depends on perspective, not phenomenological, I mean, egoic perspective, but some sort of relative uh, singularity uh, type of uh, relationship where for example, everybody can be the hero of their own story and retell the exact same, well, not tell the exact same thing, but have a sort of make themselves to be the emphasis of a particular capital E event and just the context around them could be just smaller parts of the story where they are the center of this Uh, capital E event as they describe it I I don't know I'm just kind of going through the different possibilities given the description we've been given by Deleuze so far on is it always necessarily a top down most general I was a soldier in the event so that's always going to be a bigger E event or could you tell the same sort of sort of thing where the soldier a particular soldier is a capital e event in the context of like a lot more land mass is more land mass necessarily going to be uh bigger just because it's a greater mass and we talk about uh things of topology and things like that in a little bit and you know there's no distance in topology so if he's just in what sense would he be a, a smaller part in this uh, context if he were to tell it a certain a different way where he's like the hero with a backstory and, and all that? I'd say we need the fourth person singular to go into that because we we don't want to risk putting it back into the point of view of consciousness or the self and uh, for some reason, the, he went with Ferlinghetti, but I think the fourth person singular is going to help with um, what you're trying to work out there. No, indeed, it's not a, an egoic 
transcendental telling of a story, but nevertheless, you can have these same, you can have impersonal singularities come together, forming this hero and this, this particular hero coming from impersonal singularities be part of a B a capital E event and the context surrounding him would be part of various, uh, intersecting and converging series that this person goes around uh, is it necessarily the case that a greater or i should put that in scare quotes greater context of more landmass many soldiers around him possibly you know definitely on like the same army or, or whatever does that necessarily make him uh, a smaller e in, in any uh, certain way Uh, it feels like it almost makes a lot of things smaller ease. But uh, please, Derek, go ahead. I heard, heard you jumping in. Yeah, I was just trying to understand this. Um, I think the the event, the battle is the event, which, but it it change, it 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 creates this idea of will within the soldier. It's the mortally wounded soldier. I think he says somewhere. So he's someone who's experienced the battle, gone through it. So yeah, the more. It, so the will, which you must call the will of indifference, is present in the mortally wounded soul is no longer brave or coward, no, no longer victor or vanquished, but rather so much beyond, uh, at the place where the event is present. So there's this idea that the, the mortally wounded soul who's been through the battle is beyond this thing of brave and cowardly, beyond, beyond all those kind of narrative things that we might apply to it when we're telling stories, like if we're an author, say, or something. He says it's belong beyond that. Uh, he's at the place where the event is present, and it's therefore able to participate in its terrible impassibility. Because this is the characteristic of, of the event: its impassibility, its neutrality. So um, the the question: Where is the battle? You know this. Uh, so this is why the soldier flees when he flees, soldiers when he soldiers, and each of these. Do, uh, determined to see each temporal actualization the height of the eternal truth. So each of these surging, fighting, whatever, are temporal actualizations. They're the reality, but they're they're observed from the as he said from the height of the eternal truth of the event, which incarnates itself in it and also incarnates itself in his own flesh. So it's this in this you know it's trying to bring the 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 event into the figure of of the soldier. But as he said, it's it's a long struggle to arrive at this beyond of courage and cowardice. And it's a pure grasping of the event by means of volition and intuition. So that is by means of the will that the event so the will the will is volitional volitional intuition is created in the soldier by the event. The sort of sheer force of the event having happened continues inside of the vitality of the soldier. I guess, Derek, is that fair? I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there is that idea. Of, vitality is a good word because there is that idea of action, isn't it, within that? It, it seems to be. But but I, I, I don't know because I think I would say, I mean, my take on this is that the battle is one example of an event. So it's not like a particular type of event. I think he's talking about events in general and trying to understand how how we, how we experience events and because of their impassibility. Because he starts off by saying the two sense of the, of the uh, two mo two ideas of sense: the impassib impassibility in genesis, so neutrality and productivity. And he's focusing focusing here, I think, more on the impassible, the neutral side of things. It's a neutral thing that hovers over the field, hovers over these endless, as he calls them, temporal actualizations of the actual battle itself on the ground. Uh, it hovers over it, but the soldier who's mortally wounded seems to go beyond that. So mortally wounded, who's about to die, uh, goes beyond that and experiences the battle in its, um, what, is, what does he say, terrible, whatever, uh, terrible neutrality or whatever, terrible impassibility. And it's, this is happening. I, 
where the soldier is no longer part of taking part in the battle in terms of the the actual battle the the fighting as such but he's somehow he's alongside the the, the event as this impassable neutral thing so it, in in that sense it's the kind of opposite of the activity of the surging and the retreating and surging of the battle is somehow is like separate from it and he has this volitional intuition this will this will intuition of will that the event creates in him and he says this is distinct from the empirical intuitions which talk which chorus so he's he's given two types of intuition there's a volitional intuition which is to do with will so the intuition, I would say, is we have a sense that, well, try not to use that word, intuition, when we kind of see something for what it is. I think that's how the word intuition is used there. And the volitional, it's to, in terms of will, and it would be useful to think what, we, what is meant by will. But this is this made distinct from empirical intuition, which is the actual experience of the battle itself. The experience of the battle itself being the way my foot hits the ground or the feeling of that, what I'm seeing as I go through it, the, the empirical, literal, measured bodies that are doing various things versus yeah. volitional intuition, which is, yeah. uh, it's almost, uh, and I, I know I, I may be jumping ahead, I was drawing really strong connections between this and AO last night, really a lot, but we're talking ultimately about the the representation of the battle and how we experience that in a volition, volitional intuition is a really interesting way to talk about how someone gains a sense of any of these elements. Yeah, there are two senses in which there is two, well, two intuitions of the battle. There's the, there's the intuition that one might have if you were just, you know, in the, in the battle, as you said, the, the, actual, the actuality of the thing as you experience it. And there's the kind of more general sense, more, uh, this neutral sense of the battle, which appears to only be given to the, the the soldier who's mortally wounded, I don't know if that's true, but he he does say the mortally wounded soldier who's no longer so is no longer brave or cowardly, no longer victor or vanquished. So that those are the kind of the outcomes of a battle are, are the terms we might use that terminology of brave and coward or victor or vanquished. But beyond the the, the, the mortally wounded soldier is beyond that, and he in a in a way he somehow sees that he sees the has sees a sense of the of the idea of a battle, in this uh, as this impassable, terrible thing, this terrible impassive passivity that kind of hovers over the whole thing. You know, it's 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 not an active thing. It's it, it's impassable. It's uh, detached. It's neutral from from that. What's going on on the ground? So obviously, what he's trying to do is trying to express how we experience sense in this, because the the problem from the previous series was that sense has these two uh, what he calls moments uh, being impassable and neutral. But how is that possible? So not p passable and productive. So in one sense it's detached, but on the other on one one hand it's detached, but on the other hand it's productive. It creates it's productive of, of uh, uh, in terms of propositions. So the, he, the example he gave with last week, uh, the last sense was in terms of uh, denotation, manifestation, signification. All these only become through sense. These are made productive in sense. So. He, the, that's a quite, how is this possible? This is a paradox of sense. It has these two I, these two things within it, a very a, 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 a terrible uh, anonymity or whatever the word is, whatever the phrase he uses, a terrible impassibility. But also it has this genetic productive aspect to it. And so I think what he's would, trying to do would, with the battle. I have to ask because the the use of mortally wounded, I, my eyes had like skipped over it, and I had to go back and reread it twice since you've said that. Is is the way he's phrasing it here seems to be a very poetic and interesting way of coming back to the idea of uh, the, the mortally wounded soldier, almost the resignation of this is what I'm a part of. This is where I die. I'm no longer brave or cowardly. I'm not running to or away uh, from the battle, which yeah. he was. And but now he's just almost one with it, having resigned himself to this reality. You know, what I would say what I would say 
from, from the past, I would guess that the idea, one idea may be that the, the, the battle is somehow in the body of the soldier. You know, this, we have this idea right at the beginning of a wound and, and as an event in, I just want, I'm wondering, I don't know. I mean, um, yeah, um, it, to me, it's, I, yeah, I find that slightly puzzling, but it seems, what seems to be saying that it's the, the soldier who's expert, who's been in the battle and ha has come out at the other side as a victim of it, um, but is still within it is able to, is given this volitional intuition of what the battle is. He's, 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 got, he's got alongside everyone else, the empirical intuition is what it is, experiencing it as, it as it happens. But the volitional intuition is this impassibility, it's terrible impassibility. I mean, the, the, and then if, the other thing is to think about why he references Stendhal, Hugo and Tolstoy. And obviously that one of the things they're famous for uh, well, I know Stendhal, I don't know sure about Hugo, but that they're, they're novels in which they, they have very large battles within them, you know. Well, I mean, Les Miserables uh, is kind of Victor Hugo's, oh, right. and it's the, right. the revolution in the battle is kind of central to the, the crux of the right, story. Right, okay. Yeah, because I know Stendhal, I, I don't really, is that there's this notion within Stendhal of the taking this kind of universe, this sort of distance view over things, looking things. And uh, it's almost godlike in, in the approach. I think that's one thing I know about Stendhal and his depiction. So again, it's this impassive, the author's, in, the authorial stance is one of, seems to be implied, to be implied one of impassibility, the same impassibility. So that's because they see, he says, when they see the battle and make their heroes see it. So this seeing could be this, um, equivalent to this volitional intuition so you see it it's seen the battle as it, in a, a way other than when you're on the ground kind of you know charging forward and retreating backwards and all that kind of thing okay so to say another way because this is a really interesting this i think this helps a lot so because because this lives in the place of aeon like this, this is not a, this, the mortally wounded soldier isn't having almost at this point his own personal experience within Kronos of his imminent actual lived experience, but instead he's beyond that. Uh, no longer brave or cowardly, no longer victor or vanquished, but so much beyond at a place where the event, capital E, is present, participating in the impassibility. The idea that the battle at that point he sort of realizes is within himself. Where, where is the battle taking place? The idea of the event, as we've talked through, is almost paradoxical. It exists between bodies in the stoic sense. And the bodies are just kind of doing their thing. The idea that there is, that guy is my enemy, I must kill him, is itself uh, you know, not, I don't know how to put it, not imminently true. It's the bodies are doing their thing and it's our meaning we've placed on them, almost the surface effect of the event that we've placed on these bodies. That we're saying i must kill i surge i run i'm a coward i'm brave i mean i'm doing what i'm doing in relation the same way that a cut cuts fabric sort of i war or i battle in the same way you know it cuts fabric it sort of does it's doing the thing the fabric is separating and the knife is going there but you know at any point what's actually going on and and the mortally wounded soldier gets to experience the actual neutrality of the grand event and understand the uh, impassibility is an interesting way to put it. But I would almost say, you know, I, the, talking about the red badge of courage as a thing, the hero of it designating himself as the young man or the young soldier, the never making it a personal story, even though it is, for sure is, but it's never... Yes, I'm Stephen, and Stephen Johnson was my name, and I had a buddy named Tom. It's not that level of personal. It's very deeply about the experience of, of war and battle, of being a, a young soldier, as it says. Yeah, okay. I, I can get with that, Derek. I kind of like that a lot. Yeah, because I guess he, he says earlier, I guess... He says the uh, about the battle. The soldier flees when he flees. Surges when he surges. 
a determined to consider each temporal actualization from the height of the eternal truth of the event which incarnates itself in it and allow, incarnates itself in his own flesh so the but yeah so it's this idea that the battle is un, incarnated uh, the internal truth the, the the impassibility the neutrality of, of the of the event of the battle is incarnated in the um in the fighting in the fleeing and searching uh oh, sorry yeah it, it incarnates it yeah in it in and also in his in his in the in the flesh of the soldier yeah the 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 reference to Hugo, there's no way it's not a reference to Les Mis very directly. Uh, hero of the story, Jean Valjean is an extraordinarily gifted soldier, we'll say. And when he finally gets to the barricades, if memory serves, uh, he's there uh, as part of a sort of larger thing to make people around him happy and complete and watch over those he cares about. He's completely disinvested from the actual revolution or the battle itself, if memory serves. Uh, and while he's there, uh, he doesn't actually kill any of the enemy soldier. If I'm right, he, he actually like shot their helmets off and like, like took them down, but it, he did enough to seem like he was really doing an effort, but he's very new. As far as the battle goes, totally a neutral, almost actor. Um, ultimately there just kind of as almost a guardian angel watching over it and hovering over the battle, which is really interesting, uh, it, there's no way it's not a reference to that. I mean, it's been a long time since I've read it. Like, I haven't read it in like 20 years, yeah. but. No, yeah, I'm sure you're, you're right there. And then he talks at the end of that paragraph, he talks about the God of War. He's the most impassive, the least permeable to prayers. And he quotes Impenet Impenetrability was a quote from Lewis Carroll. I think it's a quote to Humpty Dumpty, if I remember. Empty Sky and uh, Eon. Yeah, the, the egg, all you these, never get to leave the images. egg. Everything's the egg with Deleuze. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that he ends up with just these images of um, impassibility. So, and then the next paragraph, he, he now, so that part, this element about the battle was to do with the impassibility of sense, whereas I'm, the next section, I think, is, is then looks at the other side of sense in terms of its uh, productive genetic side. And this is why I think he starts talking about um, propositions. Yes, it is. Uh, we start moving into an, an... Oh, God. We start getting into what is, I think, a, a rather dense grouping and segment where we start talking through the proper and improper cogito. Um, where one is, again, talking about the sort of this neutral surface. Um, the, the, the neutral surface that uh, sort of sense plays inside of this. And we've talked through this. He had a, a handful of references earlier in the book to how sense is neutral if I'm uh, you know, talking about uh, God is and God is not both have ultimately the same sense since sort of stays neutral because it, it invocates the same elements and we have to have the same sort of considerations of sense despite the elements pointing towards two different things, sense being itself neutral. So if we're talking about through this, uh, the, the, how does he phrase it? The root of the real cogito under the jurisdiction of reason or else neutralization is a counterpart, an improper cogito, an inactive or impassive shadow or reflection withdrawn from the jurisdiction of reason. And he starts driving down what I think is uh, sort of a take and a critique that begins here of this dichotomy between the two sides of, uh, of being, I guess. Uh, how do I even start this section? God damn it. Uh, but I think I think the um, here I think the so he's talking about the propositional modes. I mean the ones we we looked at in detail, obviously, is the, is the propositions of relations, so so uh, denotation, signification, etc. But he brings all the other kind of mo the other modes of 
proposition so uh, sort of modality itself and uh, qu quality quantity etc etc but for all these se sense is independent from them so sense is still separate from them um, so it's an um, so it's f from the point of view of the entire, it's not confused with any of the intuitions or in the positions of consciousness so uh, so I think that is, is saying that it is uh, neutral in relation to the to the proposition to the uh, to propositions to when we speak basically uh, what? but the, yeah, then what? He, he, sorry no no go go I'm just going to say that then he goes he then returns to a cell and he repeats his criticism of a cell that he went through it last week in more detail yes and and so, from there he dives into uh, just real quick from there he dives into what the line what prevents him from conceiving sense as a full and impenetrable neutrality is his concern with retaining in sense the rational mode of a good sense and a common sense as he presents incorrectly the latter as a matrix or a non-modalized root form an urdoxa this is ultimately the critique we talked about last week and here he's bringing it up again but he adds an edge onto it of uh, talking about sort of the genesis and production of sense from this, that it's, uh, for lack of better words, he's basically saying the sense that is generated here is bullshit. Uh, it, it's, it's fake. It's not real. It's this really odd element of us basically having sense generated by the thing that sense creates. And this is his circular argument that he's going to be getting into and making, you know, sort of, you know, shitting on the idea of uh, this, this circular logic of, uh, oh, we generate sense, sense generates these elements, which in turn generate sense because of good. And again, the critique he had around good and common sense and the way that it works. But his use here very specifically is uh, around the genesis and the, the pseudo neutrality. Uh, quote, we have seen that in relation to the modifications of being and the modalities of the proposition, the same thing had to be grasped as neutral surface effect and as fruitful principle of production. It had to be grasped, not according to a disjunction of consciousness, but rather according to the division and the conjunction of the two causalities, which is a really very specific critique that he moves into the next paragraph with. Uh, sorry if I stepped on you, Derek. That's, I think, generally where you were going, and I want to yeah. just give a little bit no, of background no, it, for those who didn't read. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, yeah. So, yeah, it is, a, it is developed from that. And, um, he, but he says, what prevents him from conceit? So, as he said earlier, uh, previous as well, previous to last week as well, he said, Hassel, he said, he said this idea, our sense is discovered every every few hundred years and the the, the last time it was discovered was one of the people who discover it is a cell so he gives him the credit for that but that but then he says he is not able to um um he doesn't conceive sense so this is half for me halfway down uh, just over halfway down page 104 what prevents him from conceiving sense of the full impenetrable neutrality uh is this concerning training sense a rational mode of a good sense and a common sense? Um, so these are, the, as we've seen previously, that good sense and common sense are both the opposites of the paradox, which is what is the paradox of sense is that it has these two aspects of them. It has, it has uh, neutrality and it has productivity. This is the paradox. And he said he, he can't, under, he can't uh, conceive this because he wants to retain rational uh, the, ra the rational mode of good sense and the common sense which you re went through previously and he says he, he presents incorrectly the latter as a matrix of a non-modalized root form or, or, or a doxa that's the primary doxa and the thing about as he also said he said that previously he said it twice i think in that philosophy must deal with doxa so doxa is this kind of idea of a, a kind of general view it's a kind of uh, generalized view of things, an opinion or something like that. But I think what the key in this is that, it, it, um, is it, so he said it is the same concern we make to conserve the form of consciousness within the transcendental. And this, I think, is what 
is the point for Deleuze. I think he wants to get rid of consciousness within the transcendental. And um, the, so the, my, my understanding of tr the transcendental in terms of someone like Kant, obviously, is that intrinsic to the transcendental is the subject, is the I. And so what, it, what it, I think what's being said here is that Searle, in his desire to retain rationality of good sense and common sense, uh, w wants to retain consciousness as a part of transcendental, whereas I think what what the direction Deleuze is going in is to get rid of that, because otherwise it won't be impenetrable, it won't be fully impenetrable or fully neutral. Yes. Yes, and that actually brings us right into what I think is the brunt of this, which is the discussion around the transcendental field and the surface, which is ultimately where singularities lie and sit and wait and do their thing. Um, the, the, one of the discussions we ended up getting into last night that I kind of want to bring a little bit ahead from a little bit later is, uh, to me, a lot of what we're about to get into feels like the first uh, gasps or the sort of a different way of talking about how the body without organs uh, works. If you've been joining us in our AO readings, to me, this is very similar to the entire concept of the body without organs. Uh, as we start talking about this transcendental field, what is transcendental, how these things operate together, how they work, um, and that the subject ultimately comes out of them after them and those things. It, it begins to feel like that. And so this opening salvo he has, and I'm just going to read a little bit, uh, we seek to determine an impersonal and pre-individual transcendental field, which does not resemble the corresponding empirical fields, and which nevertheless is not confused with an undifferentiated depth. Uh, here he goes into for, I don't know, a good paragraph, uh, sort of talking through the two sort of sides that were given as options. Uh, on the one side of the transcendental field, there's basically, on the whole thing, there's two options. Either we have this undifferentiated ground, a, a groundlessness, an abyss, a, a nothingness, a non-being. Uh, or we go in, in this incredible direction of how almost hyper-individuation uh, of personal being. Uh, this dichotomy to Deleuze isn't really legitimate. <clears throat> this exists because we have this assumption of the subject being an a priori sort of reality, that it is transcendental. And, uh, and Lou, do you want to comment? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm still fitting myself in the text. I haven't. Uh, no, 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 no problem. No, because it was just good timing. I figured you might have a, that's a good line. Um, the, the way that I mean, you want, I... go ahead. Oh, Lou. Oh, Lou disconnected himself. There he's back. Welcome, Lou. <laughs> Sorry, somehow I crashed my Discord for a moment. Um, basically, all I have to say for this for this series is that it's like the most Bergsonian one yet, and um, I have trouble to 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 um, to situate that in the discourse that this reading group has uh, usually because like it's very phenomenological usually. Um, and I'm not very very well versed in that one, um, but sorry, I I've forgotten what I was saying before um, my Discord crashed. That's fine. So uh, I was I was talking through the uh, the the way that Deleuze isn't really looking at us having these sort of two sides of things that um, we need to be having a discussion instead around uh, uh, how, as he goes. Uh, Despite Sartre's attempt, we cannot retain consciousness as milieu, while at the same time we object to the form of the person and the point of view of individuation. A consciousness is nothing without a synthesis of unification, and there is no synthesis of unification of consciousness without the form of the I, or the point of view of the self. What is neither individual nor personal are, 
On the contrary, emissions of singularities, insofar as they occur on an unconscious surface and possess a mobile imminent principle of auto-unification through a nomadic distribution, radically distinct from fixed and sedentary distributions as conditions of the synthesis of consciousness. To me, that paragraph is a really phenomenal description of the BWO, and please tell me I'm wrong and how. Well, the question I would raise there would be, um, is the BWO transcendental? No. BWO is produced explicitly. I mean, it could be, I mean, the, the sentence that I think to me is uh, significant is the last sentence, previous paragraph, which says it has to be grasped, not according to a disjunction of consciousness. So this, this is why I think he wants to uh, eliminate conscious, the idea of consciousness. So it has to be grasped, not according to a disjunction of consciousness, i.e. saying uh, the, uh, the event is, sorry, sense is uh, both uh, impersonal or neutral and it's productive so it through a, in a conscious through consciousness but rather according to the division and conjunction of two causalities and I think this is the kind of structure that he's been developing throughout this this notion of division and conjunction of two causalities so that, um, the, the two sit next to each other I mean the the the, the one I, I remember he quoted previously was that stoic idea of if it is day, it is light, uh, and that that is, I think, in a as a similar structure. It's 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 a division of two things that I have put together, but the two causalities in themselves. I think that was perhaps it might be slightly different, but I think this is one of the no, things the, he's getting it's at here. The, the, the tree greens. The tree greens as an example of that too. It's 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 it is a tree is green and a tree is a tree. Like that you're hundred percent spot on. And so it's the the breakdown of these elements and how how do we figure out what these causalities are and how do we discuss them? And it's to me the next paragraph is him diving into that where he says very clearly, singularities, specific the quote, uh, because it's kind of I think what the series is about, singularities are the true transcendental events. And Ferlinghetti calls them the fourth person singular, which is such a fucking good line. Far from being individual or personal, singularities preside over the genesis of individuals and persons. They are distributed in a potential which admits neither self nor I, but which produces them by actualizing or realizing itself, although the figures of this actualization do not at all resemble the realized potential. Only a theory of singular points is capable of transcending the synthesis of the person and the analysis of the individual as these are or made in consciousness. It's a really, again, really crisp way of sort of talking through what the conjunction of the two causalities means. It's, it's singularities are the transcendental events, the fourth person singular. They preside over the genesis of persons. They are, uh, as he's described uh, before, the singularities are these uh, elements, uh, turning points. Uh, uh, multiple series that coalesce. Thing, the moment things coalesce, this element. And it's a really great way to talk about sort of the generation of, uh, to me, uh, the subject, how I read it, the generation of the subject through singularities, through elements. Yeah, I, I think there's another another part as well to this. I think this paragraph has got, has got a lot of threads within it. And the other part is coming back to the first sentence he says we of this paragraph we seek to determine impersonal pre-individual transcendental feel so he describes what he wants to do uh wants to do pre, it's impersonal it's pre-individual which doesn't and then i think the key here is does not resemble the corresponding empirical fields and which nevertheless is not confused with an inter, undifferentiated debt so it's this idea that he keeps he returns to quite a lot i think uh here in other places and um other Tech, other books, I mean, um, where the condition and 
the condition and the condition can't resemble each other. Or the, the 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 ground or the the foundation can't can't resemble what it what it find what what it founds what it structures. And I think that's another important idea that's developed in this. He says this field cannot be termed. Oh, yeah, sorry. Anyway, so the field um, transcendental field does not resemble the corresponding empirical field. So the, there's a transcendental field and the empirical field. They can't uh, resemble each other. Uh, so therefore, he goes on to say, this field, the transcendental, transcendental field, cannot be determined as that of consciousness. So that's the kind of argument for this, I would, for that, uh, I would say. I wholly agree. And then when he goes on, he says, what is neither individual nor personal are, on the contrary, omissions of singularities, uh, blah, blah, uh, they occur on an unconscious surface and possess a mobile imminent principle of auto-unification through a nomadic distribution, radically distinct from fixed and sedentary distributions as conditions of the syntheses of consciousness. To me, the fixed and sedentary distributions is, as he's discussed before, is good in common sense, uh, kind of as a thing that uh, the, the nature of this sense as he's talking through, the generative element is the nomadic distribution. It's a, the conversation between the false cogito and the one he's talking about here, which is uh, emergent through the mobile imminent principles of unification through nomadic distribution, essentially having the conversation that you have these two versions of sense that are, I don't want to say opposing, but it's not a terribly bad way to put it, where the good in common sense uh, that is produced through, uh, as he was talking about, this sort of hyper-neutral uh, but non-productive surface, versus this very productive and very much non-neutral thing that is almost pre, that is pre-subject, that is generative, whereas the other is not generative. This thing, these two elements that produce, uh, this one element that produces and the other that's neutral feels like, again, I, I'm driving this, uh, keeps feeling like he's talking about this is, I just can't get away from that. I'll, I'll shut up for a second and let someone else talk, then while I'm rambling. I mean, the, the thing that, um, another, another thing he brings in, so he talks about consciousness is earlier than that section you just quoted, Brooks. A consciousness is nothing without a synthesis of unification, but there's no synthesis of unification of consciousness about the form of the eye or the point of view of the self. So what is neither individual or person are on the contrary emissions of singularities. I think um, I'm trying to get my head around this one because I think, on one hand, he, he, he wants to dispense with the, the model of consciousness, but I don't think he wants to dispense with the, the idea of the self or the I, I think. He's still somehow... I, I don't think he wants to dispense with that. I think he's, his critique is that basically the world, as he's come to it, uh, he generally has seen two ways people talk about it that the eye is produced either from this sort of abyss of nothingness and there's nothing behind it, or that it's produced through good and common sense. On, and I'm, I'm hyper simplifying, like super hyper simplifying. But he says, we cannot accept the alternative uh, to this. Only a theory of singular point is capable of transcending a synthesis of person and the analysis of the evangelical blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, we cannot accept the alternative which thoroughly compromises psychology, cosmology, and theology. Quote, either singularities already comprised in individuals and persons or the undifferentiated abyss. I think this is kind of what this paragraph's about is that he doesn't accept that it's this either or bullshit, that there is another way we can have this discussion. And to him it's, quote, only when the world teeming with anonymous and nomadic impersonal and pre-individual singularities opens up, do we tread at last on the field of the transcendental. That's to him, we finally have gotten to that point. Now that we understand what a singularity is and how they operate, if there is anything that is actually transcendental, it is this 
field that they live on and that the singularities exist on and that together have this sort of auto unification and generative nature that produces the subjectivity and that through that we actually have the secondary representation which is the large scale good and common sense that is coming the other direction which is the uh, the aeon versus the chronos the bwo is the transcendental field i think here this may be early wording but that's how i'm reading it jack feels like it at least I mean, indeed, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to, like, dismantle consciousness in any, I don't know, extremist sort of way. He just wants to, he doesn't want the rational presupposition of sense inside a transcendental ego. He want, he needs to have sense trace what it does and get to a certain amount of convergent convergences that then establish a consciousness or multiple uh, individuals um, towards the end. But nevertheless, he is kind of building the machinery for uh, BWO for assemblage, uh, assemblages and uh, multitudes and, you know, packs of wolves and like the wolf man. And at the towards the end of the series, he gets into uh, Nietzsche, and Nietzsche uh, was one of the ones that you know discovered uh, the abyss and how you can you know escape the I don't know the transcendental subject, but there is an inherent risk to finding that. And he almost kind of hinted. It, it, I guess it depends on the interpretation. Like because of that, his au revoir is to almost be like a poetic end to part of his own discovery inherent in his life's work. And so it, it's not something he uh, Deleuze wants to dismantle a unified consciousness. Nevertheless, he wants to explain consciousness through impersonal singular singularities outside of it. And I guess there might be some small relative danger to having such a, a worldview, maybe. Well, and it's worth going into, because I think it's time to dive into the uh, five characteristics of the transcendental field, because I think that'll help the discussion just generally. So let's dive through them a bit. And uh, for anyone who is part of the Simonden reading or has done it, I uh, would love if you want to take a second when we get to that uh, of all of it. Um, the first uh, characteristic is uh, that the transcendental field is a potential energy. It's, it's meta-stable. Uh, it distributes, distributes differences between series. Uh, the, the very short sort of version of this one, uh, I think that's a decent summation. It's only three sentences anyway. Does anyone want to expand on that or explain it out or have a question on that one? The, it's a really interesting phrasing. Singularities events correspond to heterogeneous series, which are organized into a system that is neither stable nor unstable, but instead metastable, endowed with potential energy wherein the differences between series are distributed. Uh, parentheses. Potential energy is the energy of the pure event, whereas forms of actualization correspond to the realization of the event. Uh, it's a very interesting way to think through sort of the way that these elements or these five parts sort of come together. All right, please, Derek. Yeah, just, I think it's just, just a note really, it's worth noting uh, the in the in the brackets at the end, it says the uh, forms of actualization, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So that's in the battle we had the Soviet, you know, the, the kind of experience of the battle on the ground, the, the empirical, empirical kind of uh, experience. 
but he said it co corresponds to the realization of the, of the event and i think it's useful to kind of keep this idea of the real i think the realization does it means it's made real and i think it's useful to kind of because i think this difference between actual real all these possible etc etc virtual they're, they're all within um uh, Deleuze's thinking so i think this is one point where he he brings it out kind of in a hidden cat not hidden but you know it's not made primary but it's there though i would say like that um the second uh, characteristic uh, is that the transcendental field uh, has an internal resonance of the series and so it it becomes uh, itself it is sort of auto unifying uh, this happens because it it uh, it ha it is enveloped by the aleatory point, uh, which in gives the nomadic distribution of points via the displacement and circulation of that paradoxical element. To go back a little bit to when we were talking about the paradoxical element and the aleatory points, uh, this is where Deleuze sort of dives back into this idea, and he really goes hard into this idea of it being uh, with the auto unifying. I I'm going to use again the con the idea of Ice Nine from my favorite Vonnegut. Um, this idea of this crystal that uh, the singularity is, it gets dropped in and it begins replicating and going out from there. Everything happens at the surface in a crystal which develops only at the edges. Uh, and then he says, uh, you know, organically, the version of that would be the membranes, uh, which carry potentials and regenerate polarities. They place internal and external spaces into contact without regard to dis distance. The internal and the external depth height have biological value only through this topological surface of contact. Thus, even biologically, it is necessary to understand that the deepest is the skin. Uh, the phrasing there is just great. But that auto unifying element is fantastic. Um, then the third uh, characteristic is uh, the topological surface, which uh, Cold Circle mentioned earlier, and I know uh, they went back and forth. If you guys want to dive in again, this will be the time. Uh, but it's the topological surface of the membranes, which, uh, ex which expands, like I was talking, you know, again, like a crystal, uh, and a setup. Um, I think I conflated two and three, didn't I? Damn it. Auto unification and then the crystal. They seem the same to me in my brain, I guess. Um, it's fine. Said so second is auto unifying. Third is, uh, the membrane or the crystal element which expands at the edges doesn't actually change in the middle uh, then finally it produces the organization of sense uh, which sort of locates an intelligible world on its setup the the setup as he goes into this the quote he uses from simon and right before i think it's worth reading because i think it is fantastic uh, the living lives at the limit of itself on its limit. The characteristic polarity of life is at the level of the membrane. It is here that life exists in an essential manner, as an aspect of a dynamic topology, which itself maintains the metastability by which it exists. The entire content of internal space is topologically in contact with the content of external space at the limits of the living. There is, in fact, no distance in topology. The entire mass of living matter contained in the living space is actively present in the external world at the limit of the living and then in italics and it's a great line to belong to interiority does not mean only to be inside but to be on the inside of the limit at the level of the polarized membrane internal past and external future face at one another would anyone like to expand on that from the simonden group uh, a plug here if you want to learn about simonden we got a group going pretty damn regularly uh, and it's reading the latest translation from him uh, individuation of light and physical objects yeah. oh jk you're super quiet you're super quiet jk jk we can't totally can't hear you can anyone hear him or is it just me sound more like a tv in the background right <laughs> at it least did, for, to me but uh, JK, if you want to say something, please, please do. And or just 
write in the chat if you want to speak. But it reminds me, uh, just to to express my mind here uh, very quickly, of his later notion of this folding that he expresses with uh, uh, or after his uh, engagement with uh, Leibniz and this this constant folding of the intensity that is um, in this operation creating this inner space, so to speak, that is not just expanding in in a Cartesian system of uh, spatiality, but as he says here, it's a dynamic topology. It is not uh, restrained to a specific um, extensive uh, coordinate system, but it's creating uh, inner relationships. And by that, this singularity is um, creating uh, also the distinction between, uh, or by this uh, specific folding operations, uh, a distinction between an inside and an outside, something you cannot uh, express uh, otherwise with um, just a purely extensional view on on uh, bodies, for example, or coordinates. All right, and then the fifth uh, characteristic uh, is one that I think we're gonna end up taking a second on uh, for sure. Uh, the, the fifth is the problematic. Uh, it's the idea that this transcendental field has the status of the problematic. It distributes singularities over this problematic field and this, this larger thing. Um, the, uh, the way that he sort of phrases it, um, and it's one we debated last night because it's an interesting phrase, and I think it's a translation for sure. Odd translation choice. As with chemical elements, with respect to which we know where they are before we know what they are, likewise here we know the existence and distribution of singular points before we know their nature as bottlenecks, knots, foyers, or centers. Uh, the conversation we were having last night and I kind of liked where we ended up. Uh, Cole, did you want to go into it since you're the one who kind of did? I'm happy to try to paraphrase, though. Uh, where exactly are we? I'm not the best at starting something, at but I'm great at get... the the okay, the just... chemical elements and the the so the the way we discussed it last night was that we kind of if if we talk about chemicals and you're a chemist and you have like a bottle of chemicals sitting there, we know. Uh, we know where we know where they are. We know that there's stuff. Like if you look around, we can see chemicals and we can see shit all around us. That's the way it is. Now, what is it? We have to break down and we have to find the minute chemical elements. In the same way, I can look around and I can see singular points and I can see their distribution all over my desk, all over my screen, all over inside of myself. And I can see that, but I don't get to know their nature just inside of that. What it what are they doing? How are they working? How are they producing? What are they setting it up? And this, this issue uh, allows, as we have seen, to give an entirely objective de definition of the term problematic and to the indetermination which it carries along since the nature of directed singularities and their existence and directionless distribution depend on an objectively distinct instances. Uh, that phrasing being sort of the last part of the fifth uh, uh, characteristic of the transcendental field. Anyone, jump in. So I can try to talk about so I, I can try to talk about something related, but I'm not sure how to synthesize it with what was just said. Um about the singularities. So as I said before, like um my main reference here is always Bergson. And I'm kind of started from like the last sentence of the or the last two sentences of Um, of the 14th um, 14th uh, series I'll just read that the transcendental field is no more individual than personal and no more general than universal 
is it to is it this to say that it is a bottomless entity with neither shape nor difference, a, sch a schizophrenic abyss? Everything that contradicts such a conclusion, beginning with the surface organization of this field, the idea of singularities and thus of anti-generalities, which are however impersonal and pre-individual, must now serve as our hypothesis for the determination of this domain and its genetic power. So this, I think, was the first glimpse where I got this, is where, where I, I started the singularities of the Deleuze here with the way that Bergson talks about um, unconscious memory or, or the unconscious in his terms um, and or, or pure memory. Um, the problem that he's dealing with is that he's saying, or, or the problem that emerges in Bergson is that he's basically saying um, there is such a thing as unconscious mental states um, that those are basically analogous to unconscious physical states. Um, so that unconscious the un the unconscious mental state is basically the same to be conceptualized the same way that you would conceptualize that like the uh, the room next to the room that you're sitting in right now exists even though you are not currently conscious of it it's not present to consciousness but it exists and in the same way bergson says that um that um memory or the past in itself as pure memory exists. Now, there is then between Bergson's notion of matter and how, how um, we'd actually think of this room is a bit underdeveloped, but he, he spends a lot of time with, uh, with this notion of the unconscious with memory and with serities. So now the interesting thing there is that Bergson is very adamant about the fact that like memory images that which, which basically means um, well memories as they are remembered in in recognition as they are made present to conscience consciousness present to consciousness um, are a product and can't and and like the last uh, the last product and last point of of a process and the process is what he's um interested in and he has uh, this fa a very famous um image of the cone or has two cones basically in matter memory i posted like the second cone um in chat earlier um now what this cone actually represents is actually kind of hard to tell. And I think um, Deleuze and Bergsonism has a bit of a, like, a complicated interpretation of what the cone actually is and what not. For now, the interesting thing here is that Bergson talks about, remember, about mental states in, in, in terms of movements within the, uh, this cone, where the plane P is the plane of action, um, is the plane of matter and images, images of matter in a sense. Um, as the point where is is basically the body where where consciousness is a is is uh, dipped into the plane of action, while um, the base of the cone A B is pure memory is is. Um, completely removed from action. The, the difference between the present and the past for Bergson is very explicitly that um, the present, uh, the past has stopped to be useful, has stopped to act. And um, to act again, the, the past needs to move into, into, um, into the or closer to the um, plane of action, which incidentally then um, corresponds to his notion of individu individuation it is the individuation of the images which means um, the the presenting to consciousness 
is um, that's where um, the individuation happens. Now, the interesting thing is that while individuation, that means um, distinct objects and distinct words, happen on the level of images, which means to, in the movement towards the plane of action, we have in Bergson always the reference to this um, pure memory as the place where every where every event every memory is present in its entirety in its most detailed personal um, existence and and as i said before he, he is very adamant about conceptualizing the past in itself in the same way in the same way to be unconscious as like matter that you currently don't uh, are, are not conscious of um, um, they, they work the same way for him so um, what's interesting there you you don't get in you, you have there a notion of singularity in Bergson that's very that reminds me um, of what Deleuze is doing here um, it's a bit different because like in individuality and the relation of individuality as one well to to the cone and like the, the the notion of these events being personal this that's that's i think not exactly as Deleuze argues here but you have um again you have you have this notion of singular events in pure memory that are not individuated um which reminded me very much of just how he introduces the, this notion of singularities that are um, pre-individual and impersonal. The other thing, singularities are anti-generalities. This is another point in, in Bergson. Bergson has uh, in Meta and Memory a study of what um, of the relationship of the particular and the um, and the general, where he says, well, it's a mistake to to think that you can either start with generalities or particularities and um, go from the one to the other. It doesn't matter which way you go, you'll always stay in a circle. The solution that Bergson proposes is starting from a notion of similarity that gets split into generality and particularity, and then um, the similarity between objects, between individuated sub objects, is a movement back towards this um, original similarity. Again, this is. Um, uh, this this has some resonances with a notion of a primary difference, even though I think Deleuze would would be hesitant to 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 um to uh, to, to speak in this of terms of um, similarity as a uh, as a primordial um, similarity. Um, sorry, I can go on about Bergson. I, I'm not sure I'm going anywhere, and whether that helps. Um, but no, it's it's the the fun part about this. The fun part to me about this section is we start getting into um, at this point. We were talking about this last night. Is this this whole text feels weirdly uh, structuralist? That that this is not sort of the Deleuze I think a lot of us have come to by getting to it through AO or to me like time image and movement image, which feels less directly structural, and this one's much more. Now Deleuze is starting to get into things that are super Bergsony super Simon Denis and really tying in these other thoughts and these other thinkers. And it's really fun. So they just, thank you very much, Lou. I, I, anytime this stuff I comes up, one, I just love I having it. Right. One thing. Okay. Which is very important why I'm actually saying all this. This image of the cone and pure memory is where the whole thing about the virtual comes from, right? Um, that's Bergson's terminology. The mode of existence of the past past is virtual and the individual the process of individuation into um, the present to consciousness mode into um, the individuated images that's the movement of actualization 
in Boxen. No, I'm done. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's that's good. It, well, I mean, and, and it helps us dive right into what is the ending of this uh, grouping. Sorry, go ahead. Someone else, I know, I can hear. Uh, yeah, I was just going to, sorry, Brooks. Yeah, I was just going to return to the problematic that we were talking about earlier and uh, the idea of the chemical elements, which we know where they are before we know what they are. And I mean, I took that to mean periodic table, so you can predict where, where a chemical might, where a chemical will be, but wrong well, before you know what it is. But I think here, um, there's a notion, he says, um, so we know, so he said, likewise, we know the existence and distribution of singular points before we know their nature. So we have this notion of singularity, singular points in terms of existence and distribution before we know what they are. And he gives different examples of singularities, bottlenecks, knots, foyers, all points of change. Um, so, and he said, this allows us, as we've seen, to give an entirely objective definition so problematic and to indetermination, indetermination it carries along. And so it's this notion of, it's an objective understanding of the problematic. Um, and since the nature of and their existence and he says that, so he says the, the nature of directed singularity in their existence and directionless distribution depend on objectively distinct instances. So it, 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 this, I think, is, again, is kind of an important point, this kind of notion of there's a certain objectivity within this kind of problematic that's given. And uh, in terms, and it's, it's indeterminate but objective as well. So again, it's slightly paradoxical, I'd say, I would say. And then the next paragraph, he starts by saying the conditions of the true genesis become apparent. And I think, again, that's a significant sentence because, again, it returns to this notion that the condition, the conditioned cannot resemble the condition. So the thing uh, that's the, the underlying thing can't re resemble what, it, what it, it leads to, shall we say. So he says, here, hence, he said, from the preceding, he said, the condition of the true genesis becomes apparent. And uh, and then he, he goes on from that. Well, and, and he and he ends the discussion there. It's the the line he ends there before he dives into uh, Nietzsche and formlessness and other things uh, that I think finishes that point out, Derek. Because I really like uh, this whole section. We could spend so long on so long on this one paragraph. Um, but he ends this idea of. Uh, the double series of the condition, that is, of the empirical consciousness and its objects, uh, must therefore be founded on an originary instance which retains the pure form of objectivity, the object equals x, and the pure form of consciousness, and which constitutes the former on the basis of the latter, which is a, uh, a bit of a flip in terms of uh, the way that uh, he was describing, for example, Kant or Aristotelianism or these other ideas of kind of how being can work or the, the discourse of the individual, the person and the ground, uh, which he's about to get into and sort of dissect through them and talk about how Nietzsche took them on. Uh, and to him that Nietzsche was this, I don't know, uh, the visuals he keeps using is kind of like you know, almost an Indiana Jones type monster hunter who dives into the depths and pulls these monsters out of uh the bodies uh which is a, a really fantastic visuals he uses um the the way uh the dionysian concept of the will to power or uh the ubermensch uh and how they sort of play within these spaces uh it, anyone with a better background on nietzsche want to dive into that before i give my ham-fisted garbage version What is well, I, med no, please go uh, ahead. There you go. I think that one of the, I mean, just a, like really basic point on why he's talking about Nietzsche here at all is, you know, the idea of kind of moving beyond the human and uh, this idea of a, um, an impersonal transcendental field of singularities uh, that isn't really connected to a, a transcendental subject, which I guess would be like the, the human generally here.
he's, he's uh, looking at uh, a dimension with the uh, virtue and the, and the three individual similarities. That's how I interpret it. Could you repeat that? Yeah, he's tying together the, um, the idea of the Dionysian with the uh, three individual uh, singularities and the virtual. Is that correct? Yes, that's how I that's how I read that. As I say, you might be a little bit. It sounds like you're saying he's tying together the Dionysian with the three individual singularities. And right, the right. Right, right, right. Yes, that's how I that's how I read that. The the line here, uh, he starts going into uh, blah, 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 blah. Nietzsche's discovery lies elsewhere when, having liberated himself from Schopenhauer and Wagner, he explored a world of impersonal and pre-individual singularities, a world he then called Dionysian, or of the will to power, a free and unbound energy. These are nomadic singularities, which are no longer imprisoned within the fixed individuality of the infinite being, the notorious immutability of God, good sense, nor inside the sedentary boundings of the finite subject, the notorious limits of knowledge, common sense. This is something neither individual nor personal, but rather singular. Being not an undifferentiated abyss, it leaps from one singularity to another, casting always the dice belonging to the same cast, always fragmented and formed again in each throw. He's starting to connect a whole like groupings of the previous series inside of like two sentences there. But it's kind of this idea for him where, uh, again, the discourse of the individual, then the person or the ground, the we don't, is there a fourth? Is there another thing there? Is there a thing we can do where we, we move aside from things and instead of having a conversation around, I mean, how to put it, um, instead of uh, saying that a thing must have a shape that's predetermined or be entirely shapeless, a thing can be simply unshaped. It's not the same thing as being shapeless. Unshaped is not the same thing. That there's... Uh, it, rather that of the unformed, I think is what he says. Uh, it's not the form or the formless, it's unformed. To the charge, you shall be a monster, a shapeless mass, Nietzsche responds. We have realized this prophecy. A fantastic usage of the word. Um, fast, good use of Nietzsche there. Um, and then he finishes this out by having the discussion that ultimately, uh, almost a sort of ironic, I don't know, play on the entire thing, goes through the story of, Nietzsche's death and everything uh, as being sort of visited by this event, how he ultimately became the event <laughs> that uh, it was, it's a really interesting sort of ending the, um, the time and by the pathway, which this event followed this time in relation to the quasi cause inspiring his entire work and co-inspiring his life has nothing to do with his general paralysis, the ocular migraines, the vomiting with which he suffered with the exception of giving them a new causality, that is, an eternal truth independent of their corporeal realization, thus a style in an ova instead of a mixture in the body. It's a fantastic sort of ending to it. I had to mention uh, one of my favorite Bellatar films. Just real quick, before, before you jump in, uh, Derek. Um, Bellatar wrote uh, and directed A Turin Horse. Story of Nietzsche, uh, and it's the famous sort of fable almost apocryphal uh, story Nietzsche saw a horse in Turin being whipped and it broke him and he cried screaming grabbed the horse uh, just could not handle this animal being beaten and that was kind of the end of Nietzsche uh, as far as you know anything goes it, it turned out syphilitic whatever this whole thing is to lose the saying uh, Bellatar wrote a phenomenal movie which we're going to do a movie night soon called uh, the Turin horse uh, and it's the story of the horse and the, the sort of reality behind what broke, you know, this great thinker and the man who beat the horse and his family who are potato farmers and how absolutely meager and boring and resigned to their life they are. It's one of the least interesting movies ever if it weren't for the fact that it's about the horse. It's a phenomenal film and we're definitely going to be watching it, but it, I couldn't help but think about that given the sort of nature of what he's talking about here, the, the perishing and how he perished from this almost neutrality um, of things. And that that's essentially Bellatar's point is that the, 
a handful of people with absolutely who had resigned to this life of nothing and given up were the ones who ultimately befell Nietzsche, which is uh, the irony that Bellatar put forward. I really like the. I'll let someone else talk. Sorry, Derek. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to say this image of Nietzsche reminds, seems to bring us back to the battle of soldier and the battle, and the the battle in being in the body of the incarnated in the events, the empirical events, and but also in the body of the uh, mortally wounded soldier. And so I think this there's a similar kind of similar uh, analysis going on here uh, in terms of the relationship of Nietzsche to, to his work, to his oeuvre. And uh, yeah. Yes. It, it feels like it's almost a full circle where he's coming around to the final point saying that Nietzsche was almost on his own battlefield and that uh, his death was almost a quasi-death. He quasi-perished is the phrase he uses. Uh, For sickness and death are the event itself. Subject is such to double causality, that of bodies, states of affairs and mixtures, but also that of the quasi-cause, which represents the state of organization or disorganization of the incorporeal surface a fantastic way to end it and bring the whole thing to a really nice just beautiful bow with a i mean it's a really good callback as far as writing goes it's a payoff to the earlier point just that's how you that's how you do a a, a series i like it yeah um, the I, I guess reading this it, it, and he says it inspires his work so uh, this, um, yeah. So he has this this quasi cause, inspiring his entire work and co-inspiring his life. But it's nothing to do with his general. Nothing to do with it. it has to be a reference to the generative nature of the transcendental field. Like it's, it feels like he's making reference to that when he's talking through here that. Uh, the thing that gave Nietzsche his powers, I suppose, if you want to talk about him like a sorcerer, which I know some people like to do, but it's this idea of like, he went there and these, this generative surface kept pushing him and pushing him. And it, the, these are the things that gave him or inspired him. As he says, there's a generative nature to sense in that position. It feels like he's making reference to that. He, he talks about Nietzsche, the, the paragraph he talks about Nietzsche as the nomadic uh, element. Uh, in his own discovery, Nietzsche glimpsed as if in a dream at the means of treading over the earth, of touching it lightly, of dancing and leading back to the surface those monsters of the deep and forms of the sky which were left. So they were, he was overtaken by a more profound task, one which was more grandiose and dangerous. In his discovery, he saw a new way of exploring the depth bringing a distinct eye to bear upon it, of discerning in it a thousand voices, of making all those voices speak, being prepared to be snapped up by this depth which he interpreted and populated as never had been before. That is fantastic wording. God, I love it. He could not stand to stay on the fragile surface, which he had nevertheless plotted through men and gods, reference to most of Nietzsche's work. Yeah, Nietzsche also talked about the idea of uh, cruelty, and that uh, kind of uh, relates to, you know, his references, he loses references to, you know, war and, and the battlefield, you know, and the wounded, and uh, being able to uh, rise above that. And so this kind of, um, you know, eminence of cruelty that Nietzsche, you know, dwelt on in uh, Beyond Good and Evil. And also this, uh, these kind of pre-individual um, you know, singularities and the virtual relates to, does that relate to um, Bergson's uh, Yolande Vital? I mean, the exact relationship between the virtual, like the Elan Vital is probably a bit of an overstated thing in Bergson, but 
where, where I really had to think of it was like this line on page 107. The subject is this free, anonymous and nomadic singularity which traverses men as well as plants and animals independently of the matter of their individuation and the forms of their personality. Like this is a very Elan Vital sounding um sounding um line which incidentally here is in the context of Nietzsche and um I think um more explicitly in the text um maybe uh, going towards the will to power. And we've talked about this in the anti Oedipus reading um month ago that like the no desire anti oedipus kind of brings those concepts together for the libido um Nietzschean uh will to power and um Bergsonian Elan Vital. Um and I think the Elan Vital aspect here is specifically interesting because uh, of of the of the notion like just the the choice of words there with the matter of their individuation. Um, Bergson talks a lot about in in terms when he talks about in terms of the Elan Vital or uh, the life impetus. Um, he's talking about how the Elan Vital is more or less his name for the process of of of, of actually or, or the driving the driving principle much more than actually a, a, a physical force. Um, by which the 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 process of differentiation actually happens, and he talks about this in in terms of contact with matter that forces individuation. So maybe so, so there is definitely a connection there, but I think um, no, I think yeah, there's a connection point. And <laughs> sorry. As we close this out, uh, is there any questions or comments on the 15th series of Singularities as we've made our way through it? Because there's a lot that was said and I wish we could have more time, but we are coming to a close and I want to make sure anyone who has questions or thoughts or anything can get them in. Because I know I've kind of monopolized a lot of this one. I just want to say on the idea of Nietzsche um, collapsing back into the depths in the last paragraph, um, I read a paper yesterday on just kind of on logic of sense generally, uh, in which the author talked about how Deleuze goes beyond Nietzsche in this book by not limiting sense to the historical um, which is what she said uh, Nietzsche does and the idea of the will to power, which is the idea that any, anything is, um, is the result of an interpretation by a force that takes hold of the thing, um, which is historical and, and would be kind of a matter of uh, bodies in causal interactions in Kronos. And she argued that Deleuze goes beyond this by locating sense in um, in Aeon instead of Kronos. So I wonder if maybe one of the things that's being said here is that, you know, Nietzsche didn't, Nietzsche was on the right track, but didn't go far enough in the way that, um, you know, his emphasis on the historical and on, the, on sort of uh, actual causal interactions being the uh, genesis of sense is what is being referenced by the idea of him uh, kind of plunging back into the depths. You're referring to Nietzsche's idea of the uh, eternal recurrence as that kind of uh, an idea that is still within Kronos? Um, I I think the author talked about the will to power as the the idea of um, sort of forces taking hold of of a thing in order to interpret it, and kind of everything in the world being a matter of these interactions between forces.
All right. So you don't think the Dionysian idea is uh, it goes beyond the will to power? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, uh, so the the author was arguing that Deleuze does go beyond Nietzsche by, um, you know, with this idea of. Uh, of sense, you know, residing in, in Aeon as, you know, an incorporeal effect. I can, uh, I'll link the title to the paper and put it in chat. Just, just one uh, note at the end of this, at the end of this paragraph, he characterizes um, Nietzsche as Nietzsche's work. Um, uh, and his work in the illness as a style in in a in a nerve, and I, I kind of wondering there to I was trying to think what that reference to style might refer to, and I wonder if it's the aphorism that is um, obviously a kind of major part of uh, the way Nietzsche expresses himself. So he says the style in a nerve instead of a mixture in the body. So it's um, it's kind of coming out of the mixture in the body. It's the the, the physical. Uh, expression of illness. It's somehow it's placed within the work, but I don't know. So to me, the, the Dionysian world that he's talking about here, the, the one of the will to power, is, and as he describes it with the, the Ubermensch uh, as well, is ultimately about, uh, you know, doing away with good sense or common sense, the, the immutability of God or the limits of knowledge, as he talks about it. And the third sort of option of the unformed, the freedom in that, uh, what I think Deleuze would come to call the nomad, the, the one who is, uh, you know, purely generative dealing with the power, the, the purely, uh, the transcendental field as it generates and as singularities through their sort of auto combination generate my subjectivity. I am not bound by that of the subjectivity placed upon me by the good sense or the common sense, the immutability of God on the one hand, or the absolute limits of knowledge, the edge of knowledge that's in front of me, but instead I'm able to create and move forward and be part of that purely generative forward moving movement. That is, and that, again, it, it, it Deleuze's book on Nietzsche, I think he goes deeply into this same sort of concept and really pushes that. The, he talks about it here, how to lead monsters from the earth and higher forms to the surface. Uh, it's a direct reference there to the uh, the immutability elements of God, the monsters from the earth and higher forms of the surface. That this path was dangerous. This this is kind of that ironic point that Deleuze is making. That this is sitting there being uh, someone who is purely in the generative state, the the nomad uh, within the singularities generated by them, is not easy and that it, it leads to other elements that are uh, things that are of the monsters or the higher forms of the surface or to say again uh, a different way uh, Nietzsche's work was generative but the things that sort of killed him the events of that uh, are the sense that ultimately was put on him by the immutability of God and the limits of knowledge it, it feels like that's kind of the overall point and that feels like the Dionysian worldview of the will to power to, to me I really like that take. And unless anyone has a disagreement or a new thing, uh, I'm going to go ahead and slowly click out. I'll give a ping in now if you got anything to say. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, clean out and we will Head off. Uh, next week, we'll be moving into uh, series 16, uh, which is, oh, God, so much math and things and thinking of the static ontological genesis, uh, which is how the transcendental field operates. It's going to be a lot to go through. Uh, I'm excited for it. Uh, next Sunday night, I am going to be doing my preview and my reading as I go through and prep for this. Please feel free to join. 
Uh, tomorrow we will always, as always, have uh, anti Oedipus uh, reading happening Tuesday noon PST. Please join us there and thank all of you for joining us regardless. It's great.